mercy endures forever. Father, we acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your goodness. We thank you that your goodness and your mercy follow us. They're in pursuit of us. You said all the days of our life. You tell us that your eyes are just going to and fro throughout all the earth, just looking for someone whose heart is towards you. So, Father, we set ourselves, our hearts towards you. Father, we avail ourselves to you. We thank you that you have made unto us wisdom, that, Jesus, you are our wisdom, that in you is hidden all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And so, Father, we partake of that tonight. We receive revelation knowledge Father, every circumstance, every situation that's represented in this room, Father, you know the root and the heart of each one, and you are the answer. So, Lord, we thank you for answers tonight. And as your word goes forth tonight, Father, as I minister, Lord, I do it with the ability that you give so that each one may be edified and encouraged and strengthened by your word and by your spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, he is so good. He is so good. And the thing about God is that he is so genuine and he is so real that even in the book of John, he says, do you remember when he was talking to the woman at the well? Right? And, and she's not understanding who he is. Now, she's a Samaritan. And just that he would even sit and speak with her showed the love of the Father because Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Right? And so he's talking to her and right, he's reading her mail, basically, because he gets to the place where he's telling her, yeah, you know, um, you know, you've been married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced five times, right? And the man you're living with now is not your husband. So he says all that to her and she gets to the place where I perceive that you're a prophet. And so then Jesus begins to talk to her and she's saying, well, where do you worship, Right. And, and she's saying, he's saying, well, you know, listen, there's going to come a day where, see, you don't know what you worship, he said. Because remember, Jesus came for the Jew first. And so Jesus was a Jew. And so he knew, right, they, the Jews were taught about the coming Messiah. Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. And so then he says to her, you don't know what you worship. We know whom we worship, and there is coming a day where those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, God's not looking for any false pretense because he is so genuine and he is so real. And so he desires that from us. And the wonderful thing about it is that it's out of the, his love for us and our love for him comes true worship. Hallelujah. It's on a completely another sphere. It's worship from our spirit. Praise the Lord. There is no flesh. There is no false pretense. Because he is love. And his love for us is the height, the length, the depth, and the breadth, really, of eternity. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is good. Praise God. He's good. Glory to God. Well, we've been um, learning about building our life God's way. And so tonight, specifically, I, I want to talk about decisions. But, you know, as I was praying over the service tonight, Barbara Wenzel is here. She had shared a testimony with me uh, after last uh, Women of Wisdom's uh, service. And, you know, partly we've been talking about understanding and really what un biblical understanding is, that it's not conceptual understanding. It really is when you come to the place where you understand the value of this word. And because you understand the value, you put your heart and your mind and all that you are towards the knowledge and wisdom of God. And so, Barbara, Pastor Aaron had ministered on a particular subject. And Barbara said her and her husband had been so blessed by it 
But could you stand up and share? Would you mind sharing? Do we have a mic for Barbara at all, Brad? The one on the chair? Yep. Would that be good, Linda? Linda's got it. I just would like this to go on live stream for anybody that also. Praise the Lord. Thursday, and Pastor Aaron had spoke about how um, the best way to um, use your hands and glorify God is not by reaching into your pocket and giving a, a tithe or money. It's not by um, using your hands to help the poor, the needy, and the homeless, which that's our ministry. And so I immediately sat up and like, well, what is it? And he said, it's when you raise your hands up in the air and you glorify God. When you're praising and glorifying God. So that stuck in my head. And the next week, I went to um, my mother-in-law, who's going to be 98 in October. She was in rehab. And this particular morning, my sister-in-law had said, you need to get over here right away. You know, they were in Largo because she's, it's not good. It's not good. So we raced over there and um, walked in there. And she basically hadn't eaten for a day and a half. And now this is going into the third day. And um, when we got there, her mouth was slanted down, her tongue was hanging out a little bit. So I thought she might have had a mini stroke or something. And she would not take any water at all yesterday or even this day. And so the nurse had said, you need to make a decision. You either need to bring her back to the hospital and put her in an IV, or she needs to go into hospice. We can't just let her lay here. And it wasn't my decision because it's not my mom. So um, I let my husband and his sister decide. And after talking and talking, they decided they did not want her to go back to the hospital um, uh, and go through. She had been in the hospital already and had a lot of tests. They didn't want her to go back in there. So they decided they were going to do hospice. And I really didn't know what to think. So I, I'm like, OK. So we're in the room and everything. And um, I said to his sister, are you going to sit next to her? And she's like, no. I said, OK. So I pulled my chair up next to her, so I was facing her, and um, I thought, well, I'm going to pray with her. So I just raised her hand up, because I remember that's what Pastor Aaron said. And now I have to tell you a little bit of background about her. About her. She's Catholic, which I was Catholic before, too. I'm nothing against Catholics, but she's Catholic. She said the rosary every day, but she, she chose not to ever read the Bible. In fact, <clears throat> they would get mad at us when we read the Bible when they used to live with us. So, but she was, in her small way, she was always faithful to God and with what she knew. You know, she'd always say, God be with you, say a rosary, go to church on Sunday when she could. In her own way, she was faithful. And I just, I think God saw her heart. So I raised her hand. I thought, well, she's, she, we thought she was in a coma. So I thought, what, what could I lose, right? <clears throat> so I raised her hand. And then my husband was sitting next to her. And I said, you raise the other hand and let's just praise, worship glorify God. We weren't asking for anything. That's all we did. And maybe for like over an hour at least, we were just praising him, worshiping him. We had our hands up in the air the whole entire time. And then all of a sudden I thought, well, I'm going to play some music. And I heard a voice from the Holy Spirit that said, it's not about you. I said, that's right. So I put some Catholic music on my iPhone and we started worshiping with the Catholic music on. And um, maybe all, all together an hour and a half, and that was it. Then um, family members came in, and little by little, we started noticing her face. Her wrinkles were disappearing. Her mouth was turning back up. But we didn't know what was going on. We, I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? Never thinking anything's going on. <laughs> About 4 o'clock that night, you know, she hasn't eaten, drinking. She hasn't even been awake. We can't, we can't wake her or nothing. I went to Publix, and I got some subs. I brought them back. I, I took my sub and I put it right under her nose and I said, Mom, you want some public, want a public sub? And she opened her eyes like, <laughs> like Lucille Ball. Like. And my husband and I looked at each other and we're like, and um, I said, do you want some sub, a sub sandwich? And she's like, and my husband's like, you're not going to feed her that, are you? She's in hospice. I go, oh, yes, I am. Call the nurse, get her teeth back in. She's eating. <laughs> And I, we started feeding her, and she had cake, and she had fruit, and she had a bunch of stuff. And um, so then really quickly, um, everybody, some other people came in to see what was going on. We got her out of hospice. We left the room, too, so she could be changed. And we heard giggling and laughing in the room. 
and then the, uh, the CNA comes out and she goes, that woman is raising the roof. I'm like, what? We walk back in, I'm like, what happened? She's like, I changed her diaper and all of a sudden, she's got her hands in the air like this. <laughs> And she said, raise the roof. So when we walked in, she was praising God with her hands like that. And I just have to tell you, last week I was sitting with her and I put on some work music and her hands went up. Catholic music. So. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And see, the word, when you hear the word, it either becomes rhema, revelation to you, and you put it into your heart and you put it to practice. See, in the book of James, it says that when, you don't, when you're not a doer of the word, you deceive your own self. It, it, the devil doesn't have to do anything. You deceive your own self because you've got the answer, but you choose not to put it into practice. You choose not to do what the word says. So they were in the middle of this challenge or this circumstance, and they're like, wait a minute, we're going to glorify God. We're not going to ask him for anything, nothing, no pretense, nothing. We're just going to glorify God. And see, when they did that, I believe there was a shift in the atmosphere, and there was something there where God could move Hallelujah. And this little Catholic woman who I was raised Catholic also, we did not raise our hands in the Catholic church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so something spiritual on another sphere happened in the atmosphere of that room. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so we are learning. Hallelujah. How to build our lives God's way. And we know that the word gives us wisdom on how we can practically do that. Proverbs 14.1, we've said it week after week. Every wise woman builds her house, but it's the foolish one that plucks it down with her own hands. And there are two ways that the word tells us that we can build our lives. One is by the arm of the flesh, and the other is by the spirit of God. And particularly, if you look at Psalms 127, first I want to read it in the King James, and then we're going to look at it in the message. But in the King James, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's vain for you to try all these things in and of yourself. If you begin to cooperate with God, there's a rest. So the message says this. It says, if God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night watchman might as well nap. It is useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Hallelujah. That's him. You know, it's in Proverbs 10, that it says, It's the blessing of God that maketh rich and adds no sorrow to it. And one of the versions says, No toil, no anxious toil, can add to it. See, that's where anxiety and stress and worry all comes in, right, is when we are trying to toil and do something outside of God. See, remember what Hebrews said, it says, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without, outside of faith. We as God's children were never meant to operate in this life outside of faith. That is his language. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so there is rest in cooperation with God. Do you remember when I taught um, the whole series about the life of peace? I mean, really, we, for about a year and a half, we talked about the life of peace. And in particular, when we talked about the right response to trouble, right? Uh, I ministered out of Exodus. It was Exodus chapter 14, particularly the verses 13 and 14. We know that this is the place where Moses was finally bringing the Israelites out of 400 years of bondage, right? I mean, Pharaoh had finally come to the end of his pride, but then that didn't last too long because then all of a sudden he's going right back after him. So here are Pharaoh and all of his chariots, his army coming after the children of Israel. They get to the place of the Red Sea, right? And Moses' response to them was, wait, fear not. Well, let me read. I want you to, I want you to hear, I want you to see this. 
And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Think of what a faith statement that was. These same Egyptians who they had been enslaved to for 400 years, you're telling me? I see them chasing after me and I've lived under their bondage for that long and you're saying these that I've seen all this time, I will see them never, never, no more after this day? Glory to God. I'd say Moses knew something. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And so his response to them was, right, fear not, be still, and hold your peace. And I said that's the right response to trouble. Anytime trouble and pressure comes at us, Fear not, because what happens is when the circumstances and the pressure of life happens, the first thing that comes at us is fear. And what happens is the fear comes in, and then the pressure comes on our mind and our emotions. And what we want to do is we want to react out of those emotions, right? Because fear has put the pressure on. Now we want to do something. We don't want to be still. We want to retaliate. We want to react. We want to do something, right? And then what happens is our peace goes right out the door. Instead of holding to our peace, we just hand it right over. Hallelujah. So fear not, right? Fear not. Be still. And see what we've got to do in that place of being still. See, what happens is when we're not still and we choose to react hastily, right? Instead of responding, we react we, we don't stay still long enough to allow the wisdom of God to rise up on the inside of us and minister to our minds. Because if we did, we wouldn't do so many foolish things, right? And so we've got to remind ourselves in that stillness, we allow the wisdom of God that we've imparted and put on the inside of us, deposited there. Because remember, I said, your heart will give the response to every, out of your heart will come the response to every circumstance you will face in life out of your heart and you will do and say what you do and say in that situation will be governed by what you believe and so it's so important what you believe glory to God hallelujah praise the Lord now remember for those of you that were here on Thursday night pastor Kurt talked to us about the difference of being a believer and a disciple and remember he was ministering out of John chapter 8 particularly verses 27 or 28 through 37. Let me just go here because I want you guys to see this. The difference between being a believer and a disciple. This goes right along with what we're going to talk about tonight. John chapter 8. Okay. Verse 28 particularly. It says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now, he's ministering this to the Jews here. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not let me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And it says this. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. As he spoke. I believe there was an anointing as Jesus began to speak these words. Because, again, these were the Jews It was amazing because these were the very ones that had studied in the temple. You would have thought they would have recognized Jesus because, again, he fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies, Isaiah being one of them. 800 years before Jesus ever came was prophesying, saying, hey, listen, there's one coming and there's healing in his wings. There's one coming. Surely he will be bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement will be upon him, right? And by his stripes you will be healed. Glory to God. This is all Isaiah. 800 years before Jesus ever came. Saying there is one coming. And they didn't even recognize him. And so he, but as he spoke, it says they believed. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. See, now you believe in who I am, but he's giving them a key here because he's telling them it's important now that you give place to my word in you, that you be a disciple now, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you, you free. See, it's in the place of being a disciple that we walk in freedom. 
Glory to God. They answered him, we be Abrahams, and they go and they tell him, you know, that we are free, right? And, and what he's, he gets to the very place at the end of Scripture there, and he says, no, you're not, because my word has no place in you. And really, they were in religious bondage, right? And you look at it today, right? And there are so many who believe in who Jesus is. They have no doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. And they have allowed Jesus to be their Savior. They have asked Him to come into their life and to be His Savior. But there is a difference between allowing Jesus to just be your Savior and allowing Him to be your Lord. And so what happens is we have a church filled with people that are in bondage. In bondage to their circumstances. Never walking in the revelation that there is hope of change in bondage to addictions, in bondage to their emotions and their feelings, in bondage to their thinking, not understanding that there is something they can do about those thoughts, that there's revelation in this word that tells you how you can cast down every thought and imagination that rises itself up against the knowledge of God. And so it says that we get to that place because we allow no place for God's word. In our heart, we never get to the, we may be a believer, but we never get to the place where we're a disciple. See, because when you do your actions, your attitudes, all of these things, you will make a decision to honor God in all of those things. That's really how you allow Him to be the Lord of your life, right? Is when you bring your actions, your ideas, your attitudes under the Lordship of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember, in Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49, Pastor Kurt made this statement. He said, you know, God doesn't want you surfing on your front door, right? Now, in this particular passage, right, we're reading of two men. One who built his house on the rock, which Pastor Kurt went through the whole thing. You know, that takes a little longer getting and digging down into the rock to build a good foundation than it does to just start building stuff on top of the sand, said the guy that built his house on the sand probably didn't take too long. And he's got his house and it's like, hey, what, you know, listen, just put up a few boards and a few sticks and, you know, nail it together and you're good, bro. Just look, look at me. This is great, you know. But the other guy took the time. He understood. He understood the importance of a good foundation, right? Just like we understand the value of this word for us. He understood. And so what happened is, yeah, he built it a lot faster, right? And the other guy took more time and had a good foundation, but the same storm hit both houses, and then you see the difference. Because it said the, the fall of the one was great, and the other one could not be shaken. Glory to God. What a picture, right? It says this is the one who is the wise man, the one that comes to me, hears my sayings and does them, and does them, and does them. Glory to God. That's why Barbara could share her testimony tonight, ready to just put her in hospice and say, you know, good night, Sally. It's, it's the end. That's it. But glory to God. That word rose up on the inside of them, and they said, wait, no, 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 just a minute. <laughs> I'm going to do what my pastor just gave me revelation about. I'm going to glorify God. Hallelujah. And it made all the difference. Instead of just caving into the pressure of all the emotions, I'm sure that they were feeling, right, with the reports, and they've been sitting at the hospital with her and visually seeing, you know, the face drooping, the t all of those things begin to put pressure on your mind and your emotions. And so the thing is, is again, the right response to trouble is don't fear. <laughs> Be still. I feel like that's exactly a picture of that. Don't fear. Be still. It's in that stillness that we can allow the wisdom of God to rise up and minister to our minds and recall the wisdom on the inside to say, no, it's in this moment, praise the Lord, that I'm going to hold my peace and raise my hand and give glory to the God that can change all of this in a moment. Praise God. But if you don't take the opportunity to dig deep and to put the wisdom of the word down on the inside of you, you're not even giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work with anything. Because it's when you get the word down in you that the Holy Spirit begins to recall that, right? 
to our remembrance in the moments that we need it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, in the Amplified, it says this, The wise will hear and increase their learning. And the person of understanding. Now, you're hearing this quite a bit, and, and I believe it's important that you get the revelation of this. A person, the person of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Do you see that? See, a person who doesn't understand the value and hasn't settled it for themselves that this is the answer, they're not going to acquire the wisdom. They're not going to acquire the wise counsel. But it says a person that has understanding, they're going to acquire wise counsel. Praise God, they will acquire wise counsel and the skill to steer his course right wisely. I want to steer my course wisely. And I love it. And lead others to the truth. Because when they see your life steered on the right course, when they see your life holding to peace, when they see your life glorifying God, we lead others to the truth. Hallelujah. We lead others to the truth. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God has made his wisdom available to us, but we have to make the decision, right, to acquire it and to yield to it. We have to make a decision to acquire it and to yield to it. Now, it's, it's important we understand the, you know, where decision is concerned because we live in a society that just you know, knows nothing about a quality decision. But really, a quality decision is one that you don't revert from, you don't turn back from, you don't change from. Because really, when you do, you become that double-minded man, right? Who the Bible says is unstable in all of their ways. See, if you're going to think two ways, it's instability. It's when you make a solid choice and a solid decision that you are fixed and firm and unwavering, and you won't be unstable. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, I'm going to say a few of these quotes because we're talking specifically about decisions tonight, and I want you guys to get this. Now, over 20 years ago, for myself, now I was one, part of my testimony is I was one that, was, that suffered terribly from anxiety, terribly from anxiety. My mother would have to take me to the hospital. It was awful. And so it wasn't until really um, I was in my 20s that I got a revelation. Oh, here comes my mama now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. She was watching my kids for me. Glory to God. And so, praise the Lord, um, it wasn't until I got the revelation um, that we can do something about our thoughts. Never knew that. I never knew that. And so, praise God. And I heard this from um, Chuck Swindoll. Was Chuck Swindoll focus on the family back then? Do you remember? What was? Okay. It was Dobson. Okay. So, it was Chuck, it was, at the time, it was Chuck Swindoll. It was over 20. But he says, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. That's so good for you to remember. Life really is 10% what happens to you. Because what happens is people want to say, it's the circumstances of life who have made me who I am. And that is false. That is false. No, God has made you who you are. No circumstance, no challenge of life, no, no tragedy, no sickness, whatever it is, has not made you who you are. God has made you who you are. And so life truly is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. You are not a product of your circumstances. You are a product of your decisions. You are not a product of your circumstances. You are a product of your decisions. When, you've, when your value, now this is, so, this is so important. When your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. When your values are clear to you, now get the picture of this. When your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. Remember I said what you do and what you say, right, will be governed by what you believe. Remember Jacob's response to Potiphar's wife? Such a good example for us. When he was faced with that temptation, right, it wasn't even a question in his mind of what he was going to do in the middle of that temptation. He immediately says, I cannot do this to my God. He understood his values. He understood who God was. And so even when faced and that thing was standing in front of him, which would have made things a lot easier for Jacob if he'd have just gave in and just 
you know, laid with Potiphar's wife and just done that thing, really things, you know, it would have in the natural seemed to make things a lot easier for Jacob, but he knew his values. So it was very easy for him to make that decision. And that ought to be every one of us. Our values should be so clear. What we believe should be so clear on the inside of us that when we're faced with the decisions and choices in life, it gets easier and it gets easier and it gets easier. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that the decision itself is easy. But what I'm saying is you have the values, you have the know-how, you know what you believe, and so it becomes easier to make those decisions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Um, Kenneth Hagin Sr. said this, you make decisions and decisions make you. You make decisions and decisions make you. But our attitude toward decision making should be that of Jesus, who affirmed, right, Luke twenty two forty two, 42, not my will, but thy will be done. Who affirmed Matthew 16, or 610, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Glory to God. This should be our attitude in our decision making. Because Proverbs chapter 6, right, verse 2, says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. But the Lord weighs the motives. So a good question to ask yourself when you're making a decision are what motives are driving my decisions? What motives are driving my decisions? Because the process of decision-making, it it includes making a judgment on an action or an attitude. And decisions are an act of your will, and they always involve your mind or your emotions or both. Hallelujah. The process of making decisions is an act of your will. And it always involves your mind or your emotions Or both. Glory to God. There's something trying to influence there. But the key there is before you make that decision is do I choose to please myself or do I choose to please the Lord? Do I choose to please myself or do I choose to please the Lord? And I love it because Joshua is very clear about this. I want to show you this. Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. Very clear familiar portion of scripture, right? And Joshua says this, he says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now another, let's see, another translation, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you. Now there's a lot of people who, who, who think it is undesirable to serve the Lord, that the things of God are undesirable, but they don't have an understanding. They don't understand the value. They don't have the revelation of the value of this word. The power of the word. And so what Joshua is saying here, and remember Joshua was one of the only two to walk in. You got to think about that because what, 1.5 million, right, Israelites, and you got two guys that went in. Remember, I said what you do and say in your circumstances are going to be governed by what you believe. Joshua and Caleb were with 1.5 million people who didn't believe, right? No, it's not possible. But they, right, it was Joshua and Caleb that said, wait a minute, we are well able. I have a word from God. Hallelujah. And because I have a word from God, I know I'm well able. I've got this. This land is ours, praise the Lord. And so here he is telling them, it may seem undesirable for you to serve the Lord, but you choose this day, right, who you're going to serve, right? Choose you this day whom you shall serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. See, whether you're going to serve the God that brought you out and, and, and caused you to walk on dry land on the other side of the problem or you're going to choose to serve idols and what the Amorites, right, served. You choose this day, but as for me. Do you see an act of his will there? But as for me and my house, we will, we will, you will to do this. We will. It's, that's a wonderful thing about God is that he didn't create robots, right? He is not a controlling God. He is not manipulative. He is not angry. Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. See, you got to understand when you're reading in, the, see, this, this is the thing. People start to read the Old Testament and they get this picture of an angry, mad God. But you know what? God is on the side of right. God is the righteous judge. Hallelujah. And when you're reading all that, it's because he cared about his will. He knew he was making a way, right, to get Jesus into the earth. All of that was a picture of God's plan. And you got to read the Bible in light of who God is. And you got to read it from Genesis to Revelation, right? Otherwise, you're just picking and choosing. Glory to God. And so choose you this day who you will, 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 will to serve. As for me, and this is every one of us, the only person you will give an account for at the end of this age is you. You are not going to give an account for Sister Sally or Brother Joe and what they did to you or what they said to you or whatever else. You are not going to give an account for that. The only one you are going to give an account to on the day of judgment, and it is not bad judgment. People think of judgment as, oh, man, he's going to get a hammer and he's going to whack me. No, there's a good side to judgment. And we live on the good side of judgment because we're his children. We're his covenant children, and he loves us. Glory to God. And so you got to realize that you, and he says, as for me, hallelujah, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's a choice we all make, and we make it multiple times throughout the day. Right? Hallelujah. Life is full of decisions, full of choices. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In the last meeting, we talked about being well-advised and fashioning, right? We talked about fashioning your faith, faith shield. Of all the panoply in, in Ephesians 6 that we're given that talks about our armor, right? There is one thing above all that it says to take in that whole panoply of armor. And it is what? Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith we can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. But I said, no one else can fashion your shield for you. You have to fashion your shield. And part of fashioning your shield is settling it, that this word is truth, that God and his word are one. You cannot separate God from his word or the word from God. They are one. And when God released his word, he released his, his very being. He released himself in his word. And so every time we release the word, we are releasing the very ability of God into whatever the circumstance or situation is. And it says he hastens his word to perform it. It says that not one word of God returns void, but it accomplishes what he pleases and prospers in the thing that you send it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's the power of this word. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good. So good. So we talked about fat. And now, so let me read these two scriptures. Proverbs 13, 10, right? It says, only by pride comes contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. This right here, this is how we become well-advised. This is how we become well-advised. This word is filled cover to cover with God's wisdom for us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And I said, these are really the faith components, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, right? I said, first, you have the knowledge. You've come to the place where you realize the value of this word. And because, see, you will not treasure what you do not value. You will not treasure what you do not value. And we should treasure this word, Right? Hide it down in our hearts like treasure. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so, first we have the knowledge, right? So we gain the knowledge, right? Now, wisdom is the application of that knowledge. It's the doing what you now know. Glory to God. It's the putting to work of what you've learned. And then the understanding is that you have settled it, that this is truth, this is the answer, and I have an understanding of the value and the power of this word. Glory to God. Really, those are the faith components. Hallelujah. Success in life is ours to claim if we will treasure God's word, right, and direct our heart and our mind towards his wisdom. 
Glory to God. There's all kinds of things to direct your mind and your heart towards, right? Remember, I, I don't know which meeting it was, but if you don't settle this, there will always be something vying and contending for the throne of your heart. But let, right, he is the king of our hearts. Hallelujah. Let him be the king of your heart. Glory to God. Glory to God. I said, what you do and say will be governed by what you believe. And out of your heart comes the response to every situation with which you will ever deal. Out of your heart. That's why we guard it. Proverbs 4, right? 23, 24, 25, 26. All talks about the guarding of our heart. Hallelujah. And really, it's really cool because when you study that out, that guarding really is a protecting. Because it says it's, it's keeping is another word for it. Which remember, Adam and Eve were given the garden to dress and to keep. <laughs> That's your life. You are given your life to dress and to keep. You dress your life. Glory to God. By the words of your mouth, you prophesy over your life. Glory to God. You've been given a life to dress and to keep. 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 Keep from what? Adam was to keep the intruder out who came and deceived him right? And because they were deceived, they took a thought that was not God's thought. You see the parallel? Hallelujah. And so he tries the same with us, to get us to take a thought that is not our thought, to try and create borders in our life that God never put there. And that's what the circumstances of life try to do. They try to create borders in our life that were never built by God. They were never put there by God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the way to remove those borders is by being a disciple of the truth. Because the only real way to walk in freedom is being a disciple of this word. A disciple. A disciplined one. It means that you discipline your life to look like this. It means if my life doesn't look like this, I discipline myself to bring my life in the line with what this says. Glory to God. Why do you think it says only by pride comes contention? Only by, and that he resists the proud, right? And gives grace to the humble. Oh, these, these, I'm telling you, these are important revelations for you to understand. Because, you know, I'm going on a bunny trail. Praise the Lord. When you look at um, the demise, the downward spiral of, of King Saul, right? Samuel the prophet comes to King Saul, and he tells him, you know, you were all right when you were low in your own eyes, little in your own eyes. Glory to God. Let me see. I was looking at this. Well, 1 Samuel 15, right? 16 and 17. When you were little in your own eyes, when you were little in your own eyes, it was okay. But see, the position went to his head. And it's so important for us that we always stay, remain humble and teachable. That we always remain humble and teachable. I'm telling you, it will help you to maintain an attitude. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. That will help you. It will set you free. Because pride stinks. And it affects, it, it has such adverse effects. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's for somebody. Praise the Lord. Holy Spirit is good. Hallelujah. So you will not treasure what you don't value. It is when you come to the place that you understand the value of God's word that you will search for the knowledge found in his word, right? Give it place in your heart so that you practically apply it and you will find yourself walking in wisdom. Praise the Lord. That's where it starts. Now I want to show you six points about making decisions. Six points about making decisions. Number one, what motives are driving my decisions? Now, remember, when I say motive, a motive is never about what you're doing. It's about why you're doing it. It's not about the, what you're doing, but it is about why you're doing it. Are you making this decision to be liked, to gain approval, to be like someone else, com competitive, competing, right? To earn position? Are you making this decision because you think you lack something? Are you making this decision for money? On and on and on and on. You need to know the why. You need to know the why. What motives are driving my decision? Number two, do I desire to please myself or please the Lord? Remember, and I, and I talked about Jacob's response, right? Hallelujah. 
Do I desire to please myself or please the Lord? And we looked at Jesus because we should have the same attitude that Jesus had towards making decisions, right? Not my will, but thy will be done, right? Hallelujah. Number three, do I, this is, this is good. Do I have all the facts? When I'm going to make the decision, do I have all the facts? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 30, 13. Proverbs 18, 13. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. So important. So important. The Bible is so clear about hasty decisions. He who gives an answer before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. So do you have all the facts? Proverbs 18, 17. The first to plead his case. Okay, so I thought of, I thought of my kids when I, when I was reading this. The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him, <laughs> right? Isn't it? There's always one kid that has to come first and tell their side of the story, right? And so you're thinking, oh, man, and then all of a sudden it gets built up inside of you. Why did they do that? Why they... And then you get the rest of the story, right? So then all the facts begin to unveil, right? But see, before we get all the facts, we, our emotions, right? Things begin to start playing on our emotions, right? And our thoughts, right? So, bef and, and it begins to put pressure, but you need to hear all the facts. Do you have all the facts? Okay, so number four, is the pressure of time forcing you to make a premature decision? Is the pressure of time forcing you to make a premature decision. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2, it is not good for a person to be without knowledge, and he who makes haste with his feet errors. Proverbs 21, 5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. Hasty decision. Be aware of the once-in-a-lifetime deal and the lure right, of instant gratification. Really important. We teach our kids that too. Really important. Where money management is concerned, right, that lure of instant gratification, teaching them, you know, you, you got to think of the consequences, right, of this choice. Do you, do you, is it something you really, really want, or is it just, you know, is it something you really need, or is it just something you want, right? Praise the Lord. So be aware of the once-in-a-lifetime deal and the lure of instant gratification. Don't let the fear of missing out drive your decision. Don't let the fear of missing out drive your decision. When in doubt, leave it out. When in doubt, leave it out. Right? We've got to let peace be that umpire on the inside of us. When in doubt, leave it out. Number five, don't let past experience dictate your decision. Don't let past experience dictate your decision. Even if something worked the last time doesn't mean that's the right decision this time, right? Do you remember, um, well, it, yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 23, or 2 Samuel 5, 23, right? This is with David, right? And the Philistines had heard that David had become king and they were angry. And so the Philistine army comes after David and David inquires of the Lord and the Lord told him exactly how to handle the battle and they won. They won, majorly they won. And so now David gets, here, gets ear of the Philistines coming after them again. And so, you know, it would have been really easy, right? Because just think of the pressure anyways of him in his position and those circumstances, right? Would have been really easy just to do what he did before. But praise God, he didn't do that. It says he inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord told him, good thing you asked me, because don't do it this way. I want you to go around the mulberry bush, or the mulberry trees, right? I want you to do it this way, right? I mean, what, is the, what does the Bible tell us um, in uh, Proverbs 3, 6? In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So don't make a decision, right? Don't let your past experience dictate your decision. Just because something has worked before doesn't mean that's always the right decision, right? Now, here's another side of that, of this. Proverbs 26, 11. Like a dog 
that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats its folly, his folly, right? As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool is that returns to his folly. See, the thing is, is people get stuck in circumstances, right? Because they keep making the same decision and the same decision and the same decision. And really, the reason why they keep making that same decision is because the consequences of that decision that they keep making have not caught up to them, right? And so, but it says here, it's a fool that does that. It's a fool that does that. Keep making the wrong decisions over and over and over. Proverbs 10, 17. He is in the way of life that keeps instruction. See? When we keep the instruction of the Lord, when we keep the wisdom of God, this is the way of life, it says. But he that refuses reproof errs or goes astray. So when we, you see, right? It's those little corrections. It's those little corrections, right? Remember Pastor Aaron was giving, Pastor Aaron who, you know, most of your pilot training when you're training to be a pilot is if something goes wrong, right? If the instruments go out, right? If something mechanical goes out, adverse weather, whatever it is, you are trained to know what to do to have a right response when those things happen, right? And you are so well equipped and have such good understanding of how everything works in that airplane that when that circumstance happens, you remain calm, right? Because they say that's the most important thing. You remain calm and you know just what to do. And you know just what to do. And that's how well acquainted with this word that we are to be. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember I gave you that example, faith is like radar with Charles Caps, right? And he was in his airplane and he began to turn and all the avionics went out on his plane and he had no radar at all. And he was beginning to turn the nose of that airplane into what looked like a terrible storm. It was so black and dark. And so he had to call into the tower and say, hey, listen, I'm getting ready to turn into this weather. Should I continue on the same path? And so the tower calls back to him, right? And says, yep, all's clear. In about four miles, you'll have sunshine. And he said, all I had to go by was what he said. Glory to God. And sometimes all we have to go by is what this says. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And he said, sure enough, I went ahead and stayed on the same course, turned turned the nose of my airplane in that direction, and in about two minutes, it was clear skies. Glory to God. And that's our faith. Faith is like radar. It sees through the storm. But see, it's those little corrections because Pastor Aaron, I remember on his first uh, cross country, right? He had heard of one of the uh, the girls that had just gone on her cross country and she ended up so off course. So they reviewed again about, listen, it is very important that you make course corrections all along the way because you have to accommodate for wind gusts and, you know, different things like that. You have to make adjustments as you're going. That's our life. It's those little corrections as we're going through life along the way. It's those little corrections. Oh, you're right, Lord. My attitude is not... I see pride there, Lord. Forgive me. You give grace to the humble, right? It means he gives an empowerment and an ability in your humility, glory to God, to do for you what you can't do for yourself. But you know what ties his hand is pride. When you think you already know, right? We looked... Man, you're going to build your life that way. You're just building a shack, what it says. So important. So important for us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Number six, fear or faith. This is really important. Fear or faith. A fear motivated decision is going to bring what you fear, right? It's going to produce what you fear. I mean, think about Job. Job's motivation for his sacrifices was fear, Because he feared that something would happen to his family. He feared that they were going to sin. So he had to stay one step ahead of them and keep sacrificing and keep sacrificing and keep sacrificing until we, we see Job say, what I feared the most has come upon me. So a fear motivated decision will produce what's feared. Where a faith motivated decision will produce what's desired. See, there's a desired goal. 
And when your motivation for your decision is based on faith, even your mistakes will prosper. Because faith always leads you to the goal. Because faith always leads you to the goal. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? Um, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, right? When you pray, believe that you receive. If you continually are saying, I just don't know what to do, then that very statement right there is a roadblock to your decision making. Instead, you need to make this confession. I always know exactly what to do. <laughs> I have the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. I am filled with the wisdom of God. I always know what to do. I am filled with the wisdom of God. And you know what's so important? To have that confession down on the inside of you because when the pressure comes, you're going to say something. You usually are going to say something, right? I mean, it's great if you practice the vocabulary of silence. That's huge. I would say all of us, well, we're all women, so that could help us practice the vocabulary of silence. There's many times I've had to practice the vocabulary of silence, right? But get this confession. I always know it. Even when the pressure comes on and your mind's going... What are you going to do? 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 Right? Because it's just what the devil does. He's just like right there. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You got to make a decision. You know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? It goes on and on. And, and, and you rise up on the inside. I always know exactly what to do. I have the wisdom of God. I am filled with the wisdom of God. Father, I thank you that your wisdom is speaking to me. You said that if I lack wisdom in any way, Lord, that I just simply have to ask you. I'm asking you, Lord. And when I ask you, you said you'd pour it out liberally. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you that I have the wisdom of God. Thank you that I know just what to do. Glory to God. It should be our response. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding draws it out. It's the man of understanding that digs down deep, right, and draws it out. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. So again, these were the six things. What, what motives are driving my decision? Number two, do I desire to please myself or please the Lord? Number three, do I have all the facts? Number four, is the pressure of time forcing you to make a premature decision, right? Remember I said beware of the once-in-a-lifetime deal and the lure of instant gratification. Don't let the fear of missing out drive your decision. Right? I said, when in doubt, leave it out. Glory to God. Number five, don't let past experience dictate your decision. Number six, is it fear or is it faith? Am I making this decision based on fear or based on faith? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pulled this out. I, it was actually at my mom's house. I see there's an old note from me on the back of it from Mother's Day. I don't know how many years ago. Long time ago, right, Ma? Yeah, long time ago. Praise the Lord. And I told her I had read this, and it just blessed me so much. And I gave it to her so she could frame it. You didn't frame it, Mom. <laughs> right. But this is an old advertisement about the Bible. I mean, centuries ago, probably. The Bible. Oh, praise God. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its records are true. See, this book is true. It's not a bunch of fairy tales. It's not just stories so you could teach the kids. It's truth. It's true. Hallelujah. Its records are true. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. And practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, the Christian's charter. Christ is its grand object, our good, its design, and the redemption of man, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Man, that's good. Isn't that good? Read it over and over until it is, and they, they write this little thing on the, on the bottom of it. Read it over and over until it is in, in effect, in, okay, I don't, okay, yeah. Angie, could you get a copy of whatever that little paragraph 
Sure, absolutely. Yep, I'll get somebody to help me make. But it is ineffectively stamped upon the memory and embedded in the heart. Read it over and over. Glory to God, this word. And we have understanding about the value and the importance of this word because there is all kinds of counsel in the world. And you know, in the book of James chapter 3, it talks about worldly wisdom, right? It says it's first sensual. Now that word sensual is senses. It's not the sensual that probably people would think. But it's first sensual and then devilish is what it says. But sensual is just natural, your, your senses, your five physical senses. That's just the wisdom of the world. See, the world becomes, you know, what you listen to and what you surround yourself with, and then the world becomes your limit. <laughs> but this makes you limitless. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's good. Praise God. Close us in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the treasure of your word. I thank you that you didn't just leave us in this earth to figure it all out. You gave us a roadmap, you gave us instructions, you gave us direction, and most importantly, you gave us your precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are, you are our guide, you are our counselor, you are our advocate, you are our paraclete, our standby. We are so grateful for your counsel. And Father, I pray for those who are here tonight your word says that, that many multitudes are in the valley of decision. And so, Father, I pray for those that are in that valley of decision now. Lord, we know that, that partly that's talking about salvation. And, Lord, I believe that, that every, everyone here, Lord, is saved. And, and for anyone who's not, Lord, I thank you that they will come forward tonight and receive Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. But, Father, for those that are in that valley of decision... Lord, I thank you that your peace and your wisdom is ministering to them. That they are filled with the wisdom of God and they know exactly what to do. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. You said it's the entrance of your word that gives light. So Lord, I declare light on every decision that's represented in this room. That where it has seemed dark or impossible, that your light has come and understanding has come. So Lord, we thank you for wise decisions. We thank you that you liberally pour out your wisdom to us and that we... Father, tonight there has been a, a new awakening on the inside of us of just how valuable this word is, just how powerful this word is when we put it to practice in our life. Just as we heard in the testimony with Barbara. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we now give you glory. We give you all glory and honor and praise. We honor you, Lord. Father, I pray that our decisions, our attitudes would be honoring to you, Lord. And Father, I thank you that where we have missed it, where we've made a mistake, you already tell us that every morning when we get up that your mercy is brand new. And Lord, you told us that because you knew we would need it. You are merciful. You are gracious. Your love is from everlasting to everlasting. You don't change your mind about us. You love us even in the middle of our mistakes. So we thank you for your goodness and your graciousness to us, Lord. And that when we fall, just as it says in the book of Malachi, <laughs> We determine and we make the decision that we will arise. We'll get right back up on the horse. We'll continue on our destination. Because the plans that you have for us, they are good. They are good. They are not evil to give us a good future and hope. Those are your plans. And any plan that doesn't line up with that, Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare must align 
in Jesus' name. And Lord, where things have gone wrong, Lord, you can make it right. You can restore. And I'm so thankful we don't have to figure out how you're going to do it. Just like that seed is planted in the ground, says the farmer doesn't know how, but it just comes up. It just springs up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If there is anyone here that has not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, myself and Linda will be up here and we'd be glad to, to pray with you. Um, you are welcome to fellowship, praise the Lord. There, Angel, did you bring something? Yes. Okay, great. There's coffee and, and um, a dessert in the back. It's always a healthy one that she makes. And she usually leaves us the recipe, praise the Lord. So that's in the back. Or if you need prayer of agreement in any other area, Linda and I are, are up here to pray with you. Or take